Yeah, let's go to Romans 6 there, Andy. Thank you. Danny lives and right. Brother Ken, Miss Allison led a, uh, a missions information meeting this afternoon around 3 o'clock at the associational office. I was really interested in a, a trip that they were thinking about and talking about taking people to Peru. And uh, the reason I am interested in it is because, and I want you to pray about it, I haven't sprung it on them yet, but some of our young adults here, I don't know, I, I think that some of them have been on mission trips before, some of them have not. But I want to throw the, the, the gauntlet down to them. I think they'd be excellent. For instance, they, uh, one of the things that they do is they teach the kids how to play basketball and soccer. I know some of our young adults, they do those kind of things here when we have a Bible school or have been involved in that in the past. Plus, most of, most of the young adults that we have here have been or are involved in the medical field in some way, so it just it would be ideal. I know it's very difficult for them to get off. It's an expensive trip, not terribly so, but I'm, if I can get anybody to go with me, I, I, I won't just send them, I'll go with them, I'll take them, and any, anybody else that wants to go, but uh, Peru, and it's in November, so you pray about that, pray for them, because I'm gonna be, I believe that, uh, you know, there are, there are plenty of lost people here, but when I talk to people who go on mission trips, they say that there are places. It seems to me that so many people here in our own country have heard the gospel so many times, or there are so many churches around, and they have been so soaked with the religion that they really have a cold heart. But I have been in places around the world where people are longing and hungering to hear the gospel and hear the hear you talk to them about the Bible and the truth that's taught in the Bible, life-changing truths. And they're very eager to hear and they want to talk with you. They like your songs and your stories and they, your illustrations. They, they know that you've come a long way just to spend some time with them and you've come at your own expense. You wouldn't be there. You're not, you're not there to, get, to trick them into anything or try to get anything from them. You, know, you didn't come there to sign them up for something or to to deplete them of their resources or of their talents and skills and abilities. You're coming there selflessly to share something with them that's very important to you, and they know that. And so that, that, that's the kind of atmosphere that is created with a trip like that. I've seen it and been involved with it many times. When I first became a Christian, my pastor gave me a plan for reading the Bible. And he said, start reading the Gospel of John, just read a chapter a day. The Gospel of John's fourth Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. John is very easy to understand, and it was, was for me, and, and uh, it doesn't have the Christmas story in it. It just starts out with Jesus as an adult, there being baptized by John the Baptist. It only tells about seven of Jesus' miracles, and so it's just not just miracles all over the place. It seems like Jesus talks to and talks with his disciples more in John than in any of the, the other books. And uh, it just seems that, I, I don't know, it just seems like the things that I needed here I found most of John. When you finish reading John, he says, start with Matthew and read through Matthew chapter a day, then Mark, Luke, read John again, then read Acts. By the time I got to the book of Romans, I had grown in my faith a little bit and I needed that. I was a teenage Christian. My heart, uh, I have a great heart for people who have received Christ as a young person and they face the teenage years, face their youth as a Christian. It's very, it's a tremendous struggle. A lot of passions and fires going on in the young heart, a lot of temptations, a lot of struggles. And uh, so many of the people who were my friends, which I, I had formerly been uh, just more or less, uh, uh, one, we were all the same. Uh, they never said no to anything. Never said no to anything. Let's try this. Let's go here. Let's do that. And, they just, and just whatever, and it just whatever came up, they were all for it and all in. Now, becoming a Christian didn't mean that I had to start saying no to everything. 
But I had to use my judgment. I had to find out that every once in a while I need to say no. You know, Jesus said that. He said, he said, there's two things you've got to do. If you're going to follow me, he said, this is pretty hard stuff. Get ready for it. He said, he said first of all, you have to learn how to say no. And the second thing is you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. That's what it means. He says, you're going to have to deny yourself. You've got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, self, no. You can't have that. You can't do that. You can't go there. You can't be like that. You, you've got to be different. Not to be odd or strange or be weird. But you're not driven by what you want to taste, touch, feel, smell, and look at. You know? Your senses just driving you to whatever smells good. That's our, our marching thing in the 60s and early 70s was if it feels good, do it. I think a lot of times it was just if it smells good, eat it. Or if it's like, I like to watch Andrew Zimmer and he's on Bizarre Foods and he said, if it looks good, eat it. You ever watch that show? He'll eat just about anything. Evidently, a lot of stuff looks good to him. And I think a lot of people just like take him out into the jungle just to feed him stuff just because he's like that kid in fifth grade that says, here, eat this worm. Okay. I give you a dollar to eat this bug. Says, okay. He's ready for a dollar. You, you should take Andrew out there and turn over a rock and see something crawl around. And here, Andrew, we eat this all the time. <laughs> he just eat it up. To be discerning. To say, you know, God didn't save me to beat all the fun out of my life, but let's see what, what he does want me to do. Let's find out. In, in chapter 6, it kind of gives you the, okay, here's the take on sin. This is about disobeying God. Now you're a Christian. And he says, okay, now he gives you the big speech. But then, for the most part of my teenage years, I lived in Romans 7. This is, uh, this is Paul. I tell you what, just for a minute. Andy, let's go over to the first epistle of John. First John, chapter 1. Just for a minute. I, I want you to see that this is the way John talks. Let's go to chapter 2. First John, chapter 2. Now here in chapter 2, he says, My little children, these things I write unto you, that you may not sin. And in the, in the old King James Version it says that you sin not. So I'm writing this letter. Don't sin. Don't do anything wrong. Don't make any mistakes. Don't do anything wrong. Don't go off the rails. But look at this next phrase. And if anyone, if anyone does sin, <laughs> I like parents like that. Don't do it. But if you do, Come to me. Don't do it. But if you do, when you start studying Greek in, in uh, religious and preacher school, <coughs> this is where you start in 1 John. Everybody does. Everybody ever heard of start studying Greek because it's real easy. <laughs> That's what they all say. It's, all, it's real easy. It ain't real easy, but it's, it's easier than translating some other places in the New Testament. And they say every time you see the word if, you're talking about three different kinds of conditions. What I used to think of as three different kinds of iffiness. Three different kinds of iffiness. Ifness. And this is called a third class condition. And what that means is that the way it's structured, it's not here in English, but when you look at the Greek construction, the word, there's several words for if for one thing. And the way it's all put together, you can look at, it, at the, all the order that the words are in. This is what it means. There in the chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, If anyone sins, and you will. So that's what a third class condition is. There, you know, first class condition says, if and you won't. Second class is if and you may or may not. Third class condition is if and you will. If this, if you do this, and, and you will. He said, if, you, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 
And so, some people just really go off the rails when it, with this don't sin stuff. And we can get into that. We want to go back to, to Romans 6 again, uh, Paul. To Paul's letter. Because that's... In chapter 6 of Romans, he says, Quit that. Don't do that. Do you know why we sat in Alabama? Eh? Eh? Did you teach your kids like that? Eh? Every little bitty baby boy or girl in Alabama knows what eh means. Eh? I don't know how to spell it. Eh? Even your dog understands eh? What did Jeff Foxworthy say? Get on out of here! That's the dog understands that. Eh? Little kids reaching for something. You tell them eh? Well, you know what that means. I don't know if anybody else in the world does. In chapter 6, Paul says, Stop it! Quit! Shame on you! Don't do that! How dare you! Shame on you! And then in 7, he says, Well, if you do, let's look at it. What should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? <laughs> he said he knows that's the way we think. Wait a minute. If I sin, God forgives me. We even got a song called Grace that is greater than all of our sin. Well, you, well, let's just sin a lot. We have lots of grace. That's the way people think. Paul says, certainly not. How should we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we're buried with him through baptism unto death, and just as Christ died, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. We're, we're new. We're... I remember at Willie Springs a number of years ago, I preached a book about, I preached a book, preached a sermon about being new. And so I was talking about newness, about being a new person in Christ. Newness. Somebody came up to me after church and said, Preacher, who's Eunice? He didn't know who Eunice was. I hated to tell him who Eunice was. He said, You're, no, don't, don't do that. You should have newness of life. You got, you, you got a new start. You're, you're changed. You're, you're saved. You're different. You're a Christian. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly, certainly we also would be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, and he's, he's using words of certainty, certain, certainly not. And knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, we should no longer be slaves of sin. So I said, Preacher, I thought, well, I thought my, my old man, my old self was supposed to be crucified when I got saved. And the preacher said, well, that's right. He said, well, he's still wiggling. He's still wiggling. I believe we need to knock him in the head or something. Talk about a little. I don't believe that your old nature is done away with when you become a Christian. And we'll talk about that. That is addressed more particularly in chapter 7. Head that way. Christ had a human nature, but he didn't have a sin nature. He was a human being. He had a human nature. He had the nature of Adam. But he didn't have Adam's fallen sinful nature. For he who has died has been freed from sin. For if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Pick nine up at the top there, Andy. Thank you. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. That's something we... Christ died for everybody. He actually paid for everybody's sins. There's so many laws, so many ways you can break the laws, so many things that you and I can do wrong. When Jesus died on the cross, He didn't just put money in the bank. Let me make this a kind of an illustration. When Jesus died, a lot of people, this is their theology, Jesus put His, his price that He paid with His life in the bank, and whoever becomes a Christian gets an account, and they draw from it to pay for their sins. That's not it at all. If you read the Bible very clearly, that when Jesus died, He paid the debt and of sin, the penalty of sin, 
for all time for everybody. He paid for Adam's sin and the last man Jesus paid. He, he said it is finished. He paid for all the sin. All of your sins that you have ever committed and that you ever will commit are already paid for. It's not that he's got a whole lot of forgiveness and he's kind of wheeling it out. The Bible teaches that when a, a lost person stands before God, there's only one thing that is going to keep them out of heaven. Have they received God's salvation through Christ or not? They're not going to be judged according to whether they go to heaven or hell as whether how good a person they were or how bad a person how many sins they sinned, how many sins they didn't sin, how many times they obeyed. It's not that complicated. All you got to do is read John 3, 16. And 17 and 18. He says, you're, you know, you're condemned already, but if you believe, he says, the payment has already been made. People are not, it, it's not going to be, when you, whether you on judgment day, is you're, People are going to be judged according to their works, but only to verify the fact that God is just. A person, every person is going to see that they, they were, we're, we are all sinners. We all did sin. But people are either lost or saved according to whether they have Christ or not. That's the only thing that, that's the only deciding point. He's not going to put all your good things on this side of the scale and all of your bad things and let you let a person go to heaven according to if the fact if they are a bad, better person than they were a bad person. I, I, there are many Christians who still believe that they, they, they hope that they was a good enough person that the, when they get to heaven they're going to be able, God's going to let them in. The only thing the Bible teaches is that if you are a child of God, you come to heaven. If you're not a child of God, He doesn't let you in. That's the only thing that matters. That's why Jesus was flocked by sinners. It's because He was preaching grace to them. Grace is that you don't deserve it, but you can have it. He died once for all. Verse 10 says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lived, he lived to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal life, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. He says, Getting the idea and the practice of saying, I'm an instrument of God now. I, I need to present myself in that way. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. In other words, when you're judged, you're not going to be judged by the law, by any law, by any statement or statute of God, by any commandment. You're not under the law. You're under grace. Grace means, for by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Nobody's ever going to be able to walk into heaven and say, well, I made it. We have to walk in and say, if it were not for Jesus, I couldn't be here. All of us, every person. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? He says, but certainly not. He knows how we think. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether it's sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Do you know if you're a Christian that sin still leads to death? Sin is still detrimental. Still, death is, a sin is still harmful. Death is still poisonous. It still can ruin your life. Disobeying God has always been a bad idea, and it always will be. It's not just that it's, God says, we want to just remove all everything that gives you pleasure and that you enjoy and that's fun. And that's... No. This 
disobeying God just brings wreckage and carnage into our lives. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that, was that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of the flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, you now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. He says, you, the way you think should have changed. The way you look at life, the way you approach life. You're not looking around all the time to see what you, what, what my mama used to say, what meaning she can get into. You're looking around and studying all the time. He says, what happens to you and I? We now have the freedom and the liberty. We can start looking around and planning our lives and looking at the future saying, what good can I do? What, what is it that I could accomplish and I could achieve for God? He says, it's a completely different way of looking at everything. For when we were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have when then the things which were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. It still is, he says. You need to understand that God is trying to lead us through a landmine field. He's trying, to, he's trying to get us from here to there. And he says, I don't want you to step in the ditch. I don't want you to get stuck in the mud. I don't want you to get stuck in the mire. I don't want you to become hurt and harmed. And I don't want you to let the things that happen to sin bring its awful cost into your life. That was one thing that the Old Testament sacrificial system was supposed to do. When you went out there to your flock or your herd and you picked out your A number one blue ribbon steer or your, or your bull or your number one best of the flock, you or sheep or newly born lamb. I mean, the best that you had. It didn't have any blemish. It was good breeding stock. It was going out and picking out a sacrifice. And the only thing you could think of and what you were supposed to think of is, this is awful. <laughs> They're just going to kill this animal and burn it up. And I'm supposed to be standing there saying, what a waste. And God says, that's that's the whole point. God's not into killing things and causing the death of animals. It's God was saying, you're supposed to say, this is costly. This is expensive. This is the way I make my living. I had to go out into my flock and get the very best and I'm bringing it to God. <laughs> you read some of the Old Testament prophets and they say, <laughs> the prophet Haggai said, you're bringing in one three-legged sheep to the temple. They ain't got but one eye and their ears been chewed off. He said, stop that. Don't even bring them mangy old cows you got that, that quit producing milk. He said, those, he said, quit bringing those to give them to God. He said, God don't want your old, your old crippled up, bent, out of shape, broken up old pieces of barnyard stock. You think God's stupid? He said, stop doing that. Don't be ashamed of yourselves. But now having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit of holiness and the end of everlasting life. He said, the way to sin is still there. It's not the gift of God that God gave you when you got saved. Not just that gift. God is always as giving God and he's, he's wanting to give you life all the time. And he says, when we go off path and we go our own way, death has so many different shapes and forms. Every kind of rot and decay, and every, every kind of catastrophe and disaster that making the wrong choices brings into our life. He says, we still, he says, if you don't see that what God has done in your life is an opportunity to change, he's, gave, he's given you the power before you didn't have the power. He's actually liberating you. He's freeing you. Now, let me say, 
I've already said one thing. Let me say it. First thing is, Paul is talking to people here who still are struggling with sin. As a Christian, you're still going to struggle. You're going to disobey God. You're going to, it's a fight. It's a battle. You're going to be tempted. But let me tell you something. Find, whatever you're being tempted with, whatever you're struggling with, beat it. Get a hold of it. Yeah, you know, if, if it is something that you you need to have victory over, get it. There are some people, though, that you know, we're going to find as we study through the book of Exodus that those people fail the same tests over and over and over and over again. Let me give you just an example. I've used this before. When Terry and I get up on Sunday morning, we don't look at each other and say, well, are we going to church today or not? We don't have to decide that. Now, our kids do that, but when they lived with us, they didn't get up. They never got up and say, Mommy, Daddy, are we going to church today? Yeah, we are. And it's not just because I'm the preacher. And that's the preacher's wife, and you're the preacher's kids. Because we go to church. The devil never says, Let's send a demon down there to the Bain family. Let's try to get them to lay out of church one Sunday. The demon says, We already tried that, sir. That don't work. It's a waste of time. The devil says, hey, you're probably right. Let's go somebody else. There's a lot of things the devil never waves under my nose. Say, hey, you want one of these? How about some of this? I say, no, oh, man, I beat that a long time ago. That don't, that don't interest me. Take all your clothes off and run around the neighborhood. <laughs> no. I thought of that once when I was a teenager, but I... I don't want to scare everybody. Why would I want to do that now? You ought to be whipping a lot of things. I ought to be beating something. I'm tired of tired of it. No, man. I wrestled you before. I, I won. I ain't going to fight you again. You find out, you know, I always watch that. I used to, lock, I used to really follow boxing. I, I really liked heavyweight boxing. When someone's the heavyweight champion of the world, every knucklehead in the world wants to fight them. Come on, I'll fight you. And a lot of them have to be careful because they like go out to Burger King and get a hamburger and some idiot out there take a swing at them. Come on, I'll, I'll bet you couldn't whoop me. And so, you know, he's, I get paid $20 million to fight. Why should I get to in a fight with you and Burger King? Everybody wants to fight the champ. The champ says, mm, I'm going to fight you, fool. I think you pay a lot of money for fighting. You ought to be about that. Well, a lot of demons and dark things come to your life, throw down on you to say, get out of here. I ain't messing with you. Instead, we say, well, let me think about it. Let me see what my options are. Well, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? Let me think about that. And they wrestle up. You worry about it. You study about it. And so a lot of times you just wind up and say, well, I'll do it maybe just this once. It wouldn't hurt just to do it once. That's here in Romans chapter 6, Paul says, oh, come on. That's what he said. Get on with it. Get here. Figure out who you are and where you came from and what you are. And he says, let's just get on with it. But he is, he is talking with people. He knows that they're, they're struggling with sin. He's encouraging them. And he says, quit that. Knock that off. Stop it. All right, let's go into 7 here. Just for a few minutes here, eh? Or do you not know, brethren, I speak to those of the, about the law, that the law has dominion over man as long as he's alive? He says, you know the reason you're not under the law anymore? Because you're dead. Never have seen anybody going into the funeral home, put handcuffs on a dead guy and take him to jail. He's dead. He's not guilty of anything. He said, this may sound stupid, but Paul says, you know, if you're a dead guy, the law has no, no force over you. The woman who has a husband is bound to the law with her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she's no adulteress, though she has married another man. 
I sat there. Terry likes to watch these crime shows. You know, I want to go on there and I sit down beside her. She's watching this program called Snapped. Snapped is not about people who just kind of snapped and killed somebody. It's about women who have killed their husband. That's what it's about. I mean, it ain't about, it ain't never about nothing else. You turn into Snap. This woman, that her husband was asleep, she shot him in the back four times and then reloaded. And then she said, I don't know, judge, it just went off. <laughs> Didn't mean to. But he made me wear these shoes, sexy shoes, and I didn't want to, so I shot him. And the whole jury just says, yeah. I'm sitting there by Terry, and she looks over me and says, you know, that could happen. <laughs> she said, I, I could see where that would happen. I get up and up on the next room. <laughs> Paul here is talking to wives. He said, you know, if your husband dies, that'd really be a great thing. If your husband's dead, you can go get married again. Which seems like a silly idea to me. So then if while her husband lives, she, she marries another shield, she'll be called. But look at verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, all, you also become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be remarried to another, to him, who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. He said, he says, we were alive, and he says, now we're dead in Christ, and, and we live through him. But now we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of spirits and not spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Take that up to the top of it. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sins? It sounds like sin's not, not a good thing. He said, Well, no, certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except for the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. But sin taking opportunity by the commandments produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. He's talking about something here that we all know. You ever told your child not to do something? Don't do that. Man, that just makes that the most important thing in the world to do. I don't know everything about Adam and Eve, but when God said there's fruit there in the middle of the garden, you're not supposed to eat that fruit. I think Eve started thinking right away, well, that must be some really good fruit. Let's go at least see what it was. Yeah, it's real pretty. It's something about saying no where you can't have this. <laughs> we thought, we, we, when we started out, we thought there were certain boys that we would tell our daughter that she could not see. He's not, he's the new. No, uh-uh. And it doesn't matter how uh-uh he is, our daughter just seemed like she was more and more enamored by him. Oh, yeah. This is somebody that mom and daddy don't like. He's got to be great. This would really make mom and daddy mad if I brought him home. It's not just my daughter, though. It's me. It's like putting wet paint on a park bench. You touch it, see if it's really, is it really wet paint? Paul here is saying, you know, when God said don't do something, he said, that's the very first time I ever thought about doing it. I was once alive without the law, but then the commandment came and sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found it brought death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Take 17 of them, uh, 13, I'm sorry. 17 and 13. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin through the commandment might become exceeding sin. But that's what is. Phew. Think, oh man, that makes my head hurt. What he's saying is. What your parents are trying to do is they, they say, I really want what's the best for you. I'm trying to help. And I'm probably not doing it the right way. When God says, don't play in the street, he, he doesn't want you to get run over. 
we automatically think it must really be fun to play in the highway. And God says, no, you can get squashed out there. Somebody will run over you. It's dangerous. All of God's commands are to instruct us, to protect us, to correct us, to, to guide us, to help us. God says, don't, don't touch the stove. It's hot. Don't run with scissors. I saw a little boy out there working with us uh, at Garfield yesterday, running around with hedge clippers. That, that, I said, whose kid is that? <laughs> whose kid is that running around with his sharp hedge clippers? And then, I saw that they'd gone to uh, Mackey and they had gone to Home Depot or whatever, and they brought back a brand new lawnmower in a box. I, I guess I confess, I've never seen a brand new lawnmower in a box. I was intrigued right away. And so after a little while, nobody was playing with it. And I'd been weed eating, and I was about tired of weed eating. I thought, well, I'll mow a little while. Brand new lawnmower. And I opened that thing up, and I took it out. And every kid around there, all them little kids, started coming up going, ooh, oh, look at that. And can I help? Let me pull on this. And I said, right, get away. Leave this alone. <laughs> Whose kids are these? And I have, it's going to have to put it together, some things you have to assemble. Got to put oil in it, got to put some in it. Them kids, they're trying to help me out. And uh, I'm saying, I don't want y'all to get hurt. This will this will cut your leg off. And, and, oh, you can't, you can't mow when I get it fixed. Uh, and that's gas, you're not supposed to. So I wasn't their mama or daddy, so I didn't have to be nice about it. Just, I was just that mean, grouchy guy that came from Alabama. Okay, get away, go away. And then I, then I, all of a sudden, I said, ooh, look at that big box that the lawnmower came in. <laughs> and pretty soon they was playing four. And they was climbing in that box, and now the box and flipping it over, and they found out what was most fun about life was when your mom and daddy bought a new dryer or a new dishwasher, and they came in a great old big box, and you could play with it. So I was saved. I said, yeah, it kind of looks like all the commandments are just really a lot of trouble and they're not much fun. Said, no, God wouldn't, that wasn't God's intention all along. The law is spiritual, I'm carnal, so I don't sin. For what I'm doing, I, I don't understand. What I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate. That I do. Paul says, I, I want to do right, but I, I'm having a hard time. I don't always do it. If then I do what I will not, I don't want to do, I agree with the law that is good. But now it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth not, nothing good dwells. And I think that's where he's saying that our sin nature is still there. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I find not. That's why, I'm, and as a young teenager, as a teenage Christian, I lived there, I said, I, I want to do what's right. I want to be a good Christian. I want to be a good person. I want to mature, and I want to grow up. I want to be strong. I want to have good values. I, I want to meet good people. I want to marry a good person. I want to have a, a nice family. I want to have a future that has filled with God. I want to be, that's, I had all that in my mind. I want to do great things for God. I want God to use me. I want to be, I want to make a difference. I want to be a part of what God has done for me in the lives of others. And sometimes, often I failed. And I, I wanted to, but I couldn't. Sometimes I did the things, I was struggling with things that, that every teenager struggles with. Look at verse 19. For the good that I will to do, the good that I want to do, I, I do not. But the evil that I don't want to do is that what I practice. And if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I that do it, but it's sin that dwells in me. I believe that sin still dwells in you. Sin still dwells in me. It's our sin nature. Verse 23, he says, I see another law in my members, my fingers, 
my toes, my hands, my feet, my, my parts of my body, and my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And that's a very important statement right there. He, he, he kind of, he's kind of like, ah! He's throwing up his hands. Oh, wretched man that I am. And that's the way as a teenager I felt as a Christian a lot of times. I said, oh man, I feel so dirty. I feel so, it's like such a failure. I think it's such a terrible job. I'm, I'm not doing it well at all. Do you know what I was plagued with as a young teenage Christian? I wonder if I'm really saved. I'm not sure if I'm saved. Maybe I'm saved or maybe I'm not. And I found out that a lot of, a lot of newborn Christians, a lot of young people, people hadn't been Christian very long, they say, am I saved? I don't act like I'm saved. I think I'm saved. I, I, I did all the things that the preacher says you got to do to be saved. I, I prayed to ask Jesus in my heart. I walked out. I got baptized. I signed things. And I, but I, boy, this doesn't seem like I'm a Christian. I don't feel very Christian. I just did something that's not Christian at all. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? What he's talking about there, I'm ready to finish up longer than I intended. He's talking to the Romans about a Roman legal custom. The Romans were experts at crime and punishment. They brought... As a matter of fact, they brought the kind of order to the world to create a kind of world that was the only situation that would actually allow for the prosperous spread of the gospel. Paul knew that the lawfulness of Rome, the, the, the iron bar law of Rome, was good for the spread of the gospel. We, we know the way they treated some criminals, they crucified them. But another thing they did in the city of Rome is that if you were convicted of killing someone, they would tie the corpse of the person that you killed to your back. You killed someone and said they would take that person's body. You, you've been found guilty. They would tie that person to you. And you had to walk around through town, through the city of Rome. You know what you had to shout? I'm guilty. I'm a wretched man. Oh, wretched man. I'm a wretched man. I'm, I'm guilty. I'm a murderer. And Paul says, I know I'm a Christian. I know that I'm saved. And I'm still dragging around this old dead body. He said, who's going to deliver me in the the English says, from the body of this death. And that's not what it means at all. A literal translation said, O wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this dead body that I'm dragging around? He said, I'm, I'm war, the wars. And me, and a, me and a dead guy are fighting all the time. What I want to do and what I should do and what Jesus saved me to do and what Christ freed me to be able to do. He said, I'm torn up about this. How am I going to, who's going to deliver me? He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I with the mind serve the law of God with the flesh, the law of sin. He says, I, I've had to realize that I'm going to be dragging around this dead body all my life. One day God's going to deliver me. But he says, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? This dead body. It's that old me still there. My old temper. My old habits are still there. My old way of talking. My old vocabulary. My old cuss words are still there. My, my old dirty jokes, they're still there. I still remember every one of them. Every picture of pornography that I've ever seen, I can call it to my mind with just a thought. Every song that I've ever heard, every, every vile thing that I've ever tasted, every sin that I've ever sampled or indulged in is still a part of my memory and my mind. 
And sometimes I can see it clearly in my mind and I can smell it and I can feel it and I can touch it. It's still there trying to rule me and, and shape me and change me. I want to look at one more verse, chapter 8, verse 1. And this, is, this really belongs at the end of chapter 7 because it's kind of like he draws a line. He says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So, whew, all right. I thought that in spite of everything I did to be saved and to become a Christian, that I might still wind up at the end of my life standing before God and God saying, well, you just didn't cut it. You didn't make it. Uh, you're, you're not coming into heaven. You're, I'm sorry, you blew it. He says, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In chapter 6, he says, come on, straighten up. Walk a straight line. Be, be a good Christian. But, and he says, it's going to be hard. And, and you're not always going to succeed. You're dragging around an old stinking dead body. And he says, the only thing that's really ever going to save you in the long run is that Jesus is just going to let you in. And you don't deserve it. I don't. Well, as you go home, let's pray jo Joanne home. She's just gonna, it's going to be just about dark when she pulls in the driveway. But it's not raining on her now. Pray for our young adults as I get ready to spring this on. It's really unfair. I'm not going to be disappointed in any of them if they all say, oh, I just can't. That's all right. It'll give them something to think about. And the next time I ask them, it'll be easier for them to think about it some more. They might just, it's just might just jump right in over their heads into something that they're not qualified for and don't have enough money to do and might just actually have to just completely trust God and give the world what a ride that will be. God bless you. You go home. You're dismissed tonight.